Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I have another couple of really fun interviews for you this week. I hope your week is going well so far. I hope your March is going well so far. And as I seem to always do at the beginning of the month, I will say, can you believe it's March already? <laughs> It's crazy, especially since um, the last few days here in Northern California, it's been in the mid to upper 70s. That just seems wrong. For those of you who are still having snow, I really apologize for complaining that it's been in the 70s because, uh, I don't know, we could just have a happy medium somewhere. I'll send you some of our, our heat, you send me a little bit of your cool, and we'll go from there. At any rate, uh, I do have those interviews for you this week. Today, I am speaking with Kim Taylor Blakemore about her new historical fiction novel. It's called The Companion. It is really good. You know I love historical fiction. This one is not only historical fiction, but it is women's fiction, which is appropriate since it is, in fact, March now, and it is Women's History Month. I'm going to read the description of the book, but before I get to that, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, um, as you can probably tell, I've had a cold. What else is new? Readers of the podcast, readers, listeners of the podcast will know that, you know, I tend to get colds more frequently than is strictly necessary for any person. Uh, so if I sound like Darth Vader at any point during this um, episode, I apologize. I tried not to breathe into the microphone, but it, it, it happens. And then also, <laughs> I think during the interview, I'm not really sure my NyQuil had worn off yet. And so there were times when I could not come up with words at all. Um, <sighs> it certainly wasn't English that was happening in my brain because my vocabulary was shot all to heck. And so if there's some abrupt editing in here, it's because I had to cut out parts where I just could not, I could not find any appropriate words. Thankfully, Kim was extremely patient with me and there was a lot of giggling. But there are places where I did have to cut some things out. And so if there's some some odd little editing bumps, that is the reason why. Um, Let's go ahead and get to the description of this book. It's called The Companion. 1855, New Hampshire. Lucy Blunt is set to hang for a double murder. Murderess or victim? Only Lucy knows the truth. In the shadow of the gallows, Lucy reflects on the events that led to her bitter downfall. From the moment she arrived at the rambling Burton mansion looking for work and a better life to the grisly murders themselves. In a mysterious household full of locked doors and forbidden affections, Lucy slips comfortably into the shadows, where she believes the indiscretions of her past will remain hidden. But when Lucy's rising status becomes a threat to the mistress's current companion, the delicate balance of power and loyalty begins to shift, setting into motion a brewing storm of betrayal, suspicion, and rage. Now, with her execution looming closer, Lucy's allies fight to have her sentence overturned as the tale she's spinning nears its conclusion. But how much of her story can we trust? After all, Lucy's been known to bend the truth. So, there is the description of The Companion by Kim Taylor Blakemore. As I said, it's historical fiction. It is really fascinating and... I was pretty much sucked in from the beginning. The, it's one of those stories where you don't quite know if you can trust not only Lucy as the narrator, 
um, well, she is the narrator, so it's told from her perspective. So you're never quite sure if you can trust any of the characters in the story. Um, do you sympathize with Lucy? Do you sympathize with the other characters? What really happened here? Who, who's telling the truth? Which side of the story is accurate? Are they all accurate? You know, because there's always multiple sides to every story. There's a lot of mystery and a lot of uncertainty and, um, just so many different layers. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn now to that interview with Kim so she can explain it to you better than I can. And before we get to the interview, I do have copies of this wonderful book to give away. So stay tuned until the end of the podcast to find out how you could win a copy or be entered into the giveaway to win a copy of The Companion by Kim Taylor Blakemore. And now let's go ahead and turn to that interview with Kim. Hi, Kim. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. Thank you so much for having me on, Sarah. I am happy to have you on. We are here to talk about your new novel, The Companion. Before we get to the novel, though, um, if you could share a bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Yes, I, I am a historical mystery novelist, um, and I bent saber. You're asking for strange things, right? No, sorry. I mean, let me take sure, that. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I write historical mystery novels, and I also, um, when I'm not doing that, I fence saber pretty badly, but it's very fun, and um, live in beautiful Portland, Oregon. Nice. And are you doing your part to keep Portland weird? Um, I no, I'm not that weird. I'm actually more <laughs> of a nerd. So <laughs> oh, that's cool. Too. I, I, I haven't joined the Portland weird part yet. <laughs> well, that's okay. There's plenty of people, I'm sure, working towards that that goal. Exactly. Exactly. That, that's just the reach of that is like way too far for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as I said, the, the book is called The Companion. Can you give a, a quick overview of the story? Yes, it's uh, set in 1855 New Hampshire, and it's about a young woman, Lucy Blunt, who has been convicted of killing two people in the house she works. And in the last days of her life, uh, she tells the story of what really happened or her version of what really happened. So uh, it's a lot about lies and secrets. Yes. And um, so what was your inspiration for the story? Did you have a particular jumping off point? I tend to come up with stories very visually and at one point oh gosh I guess it was about 12 years ago I remember sitting down and just starting to write images that were coming in my head and one came into my head about a young woman in a white cell of stone and there was a really high window with very cold light through it and she was sitting absolutely still in a chair in the middle, then turned to me and said, stories move in circles, and started to tell her story. And so that's where it really started, where I was like, wow, who is this and what happened? Um, so that was my response, that, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I write very cinematically, and I think that way. So when I get images like that, if they stay, stick with me, I'll, I'll keep trying to dig in and write towards the image. And she started talking. She had another scene that came to my head. Um, and I don't know who this woman is at this time. Uh, she's crouched over a dead woman pulling pearls off of her neck. And I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> so what is this about? And I started writing Lucy Blunt. She was called Polly Bunting at the time. And then I got probably 12 pages into it and said, I actually don't know what this story is yet. So I kept putting it away and pulling it out, putting it away and pulling it out. And each time I did that at, whether I was at a workshop or whatever, I said, I'm not a good enough writer for this book yet. So I'd put it away. Then, um, I went to a workshop at the coast here in Oregon 
and I was all prepared to write about a female jazz band in the 30s. That was my goal. The first prompt that the facilitator gave us was write about your writing as if it was an animal. And Lucy Blunt came flying out. And the entire three days of the workshop, every prompt was Lucy talking. And I said, I guess it's time to tell the story of the woman that was originally in the cell at the beginning. And which was great because oh. I love Gothic novels, <laughs> historical <laughs> mysteries, et cetera. So I'm like, oh, good. Now it's her turn. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, that's mm-hmm. fascinating. Let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking a little bit about the flow of the narrative and the arc of the story. This is one of those uh, funny little editing bumps that I was speaking of at the beginning because for the life of me, I could not say the word nonlinear or I could not think of the word nonlinear. And then I was trying to say nonlinear, no, see, nonlinearly. I promised Kim I'd never use that word in an interview again. Nonlinearly. Couldn't say it. Couldn't think of it. Um, yeah, good times. So that's something you have to look forward to coming up right after this break. Stay tuned. TSMC Beauty Tips Podcast gives you advice on everything from hair to fashion to skincare products. We'll talk about the latest trends in makeup, hairstyles, and anti-aging remedies. And we'll cover all of the newest fashion trends. If you have an interest in or questions about the beauty trends that might work best for you, the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with Kim Taylor Blakemore. We are talking today about her new novel, The Companion. And before the break, Kim was talking about how this story idea came to her in this very visual way. And so just to refresh your memory, that is what she was talking about right before the break. In fact, mm-hmm. um, it, it sounds like the the story came to you kind of how it comes in the book sort of back and forth uh, <laughs> a little bit because you, it, mm-hmm. it is told from, you know, the end of her life, which she's been convicted um, or the end of her story and it goes back to the, uh, to the story of her time in the house, but also goes back further to what brought her to the house. Mm-hmm. So you get this kind of mm-hmm. um, in, in, what do I, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Nonlinear. Yeah. Um, a really big thing is in this story is how Lucy tells the truth or doesn't tell the truth. I think it's her lies that have caught up to her within this story. And I wanted to uh, go back to that first central uh, sentence she told me earlier when I started, that stories move in circles. So I really wanted to play with that idea of when you tell a story, the memory changes. And when you tell that memory, you think of another memory. And so that gave me the chance to have her in the last few days in the prison. That moves actually very linearly if it was read all by itself. But as she's telling the story of what happened, it gave a great freedom to how that story was told. Because it could be so intimate in her words to I'm talking to you about what happened at the house, but it reminds me of when my mother and brother died and what I think about God and et cetera. So I think it lends itself well to her mind space. And it's fun to write that way. Let's talk a little bit more about Lucy as the main character. What about her? Because she's not always a reliable narrator. You you don't always trust what she's telling you. Um, but w- so, what about mm-hmm. her? Do you think will resonate with readers as the main character? I think that she is complex and complicated. She's tough. She lives by her wits. She's cunning. She's charming. 
she's somewhat honest sometimes, other times not. But every decision she makes at the time she thinks is a good decision. Later on, all the consequences of those decisions aren't so good. But I love her. I love her mix of naivety, vulnerability, and cunning. And I think that that's just like a really fun sort of character to tell. And also as a reader, not being absolutely on solid ground with what she's saying and still loving her. Mm -hmm. There's also um, other female characters in the book. In fact, it kind of centers on female characters of different class, of different um, circumstances and all of them are act all of them are of course living their lives and and reacting to the circumstances of their lives but because it's 1855 the and there's differences in class it's almost it, it's it's female characters who you know in some ways lack agency so um talk about the effects of the that that the arc of the story mm-hmm. and how that affects the characters and their relationships. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you point out something that's really important in the story about the three women. So we have Lucy, the maid, we have the mistress of the house, Eugenie, and we have the mistress's companion, Rebecca. All three of them have no agency in 1855, certainly. So the mistress of the house is blind. She is treated as an invalid by her husband, by the com- uh, her Rebecca, the companion. She, the doors are all locked in the house, so she doesn't go out and wander around. Uh, so she has no agency. Rebecca is the penniless cousin of the husband. She absolutely has no agency. That was very common at the time that the unwed, penniless cousin or sister would live at somebody else's house. So she is absolutely beholden to that household to keep her there. And then Lucy has no agency. She's a fallen mill girl. She's uh, conned her way into other jobs. She's lied her way into this job. Because if she doesn't have this job, she has no money and she's not going to survive. It's, you know, it's the dead of winter there. She has to have a position. So those three of having no agency are three women without power trying to find any power they can. And it turns out it's often against each other because the Rebecca and Lucy, for instance, have their fight and struggle between who is the companion, who has the higher agency in this small realm that we're allowed in 1855. Right, and so there's a lot of um, kind of power struggles in in the household, but there's also, mm-hmm. um, as anytime you have life in community, there's jealousies, there's um, there's differences of personality, but there's also uh, a sexual attraction going on, and so there's some of that mm-hmm. in terms of the jealousy. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. can you talk a little bit about those relationships? And because you're never quite sure where anyone stands in terms of the uh, the sexual relationships or the romantic relationships in the book. Mm-hmm. So Lucy is attracted to people who give her attention. And she was kicked out of her house originally by her father when he was a very horrible alcoholic. She was gained the attention of the mill manager where she was working, had a child with him. But her um, whole, see, this is terrible. (laughs) Go back to your question. (laughs) (laughs) My dog is barking in the other room, and I'm trying to figure this out. I'm like, wait, what? This question's so complicated. I'm sorry. Do you, I don't know how to make it simpler. No. Do, you, um, <laughs> do you want to start it's over? It's perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine. So I think with Lucy, it's not a matter of her sexuality being about a man or a woman. It's about who pays attention to her. And 
the mistress turns her full attention on Lucy. Unfortunately, she has done that in the past with other maids. But for Lucy, she sees someone in the house who is not seen as she really is. And so she sees Eugenie, the mistress, as having much more uh, complexity and is she's attracted to her. And Eugenie sees in Lucy her own power and how she's different. So within this, they end up having a relationship together which is forbidden on two levels, one because they're two women, but mostly because of the class. So at that time in New Hampshire and New England, two women being together was not as frowned upon. It wasn't even really thought about. Women at the time were in many romantic relationships in terms of friendship, I'm not talking like necessarily sexually. There were Boston marriages, which were fairly common, women who lived together for economics, for friendships, for romantic reasons, who knows. Henry James wrote a book about a Boston marriage called The Bostonians. And for me, that relationship particularly grew very organically and it grew out of the two women having no agency and having people not see them as they were. So they saw each other more honestly. But again, mm -hmm. it's also, Lucy makes not such great choices in her choices of romantic partners. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and that's part of the naivety of her. She's like, well, they're paying attention to me. I'm worth something. Her father earlier says she's worth nothing. Right. So she grabs and hangs on to those people. Yeah, and you can really see the arc of her character as it develops through, the, as you mentioned, the death of her mother and her brother, then her, her father turning to alcoholism. You can kind of just see this this progression as she, um, because she grew up in a, in a fairly, um, I would say probably middle class family, you know, not mm -hmm. um, kind of mm -hmm. between where Eugenie is and where she ends up as a maid. But um, she just keeps making these decisions that take her down roads that eventually lead to, you know, where she ends up in the book. We're going to go ahead and take our second break of the podcast. And when we come back, we are going to talk about research. If you think research is boring, you have never talked about the subject with Kim Taylor Blakemore. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. SMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with Kim Taylor Blakemore about her novel, The Companion, which is historical fiction. So, of course, that is going to involve some research, as I mentioned before the break. Let's go ahead and get back to that interview. How much research did you do for the story? Research is the part of me that is the biggest nerd of the century. I love, I love researching. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I really do. I um, had a chance to go to New Hampshire twice to do research, and I met with um, this incredible rock star librarian at the State Library 
who I had been in contact with earlier. One of the hardest things in, in researching this book was finding out what happened to women felons at the time. There's not a lot of records you can find on that. And it took almost a year of trying to contact different people, including the New Hampshire prison systems historian, to get information. And I was literally almost at the end of my rope and someone said, contact the state library because they keep a lot of things in that big building. <laughs> so I contacted them and the librarian, Rebecca Stockbridge, wrote me back and she said, I have all the warden's records from that time period. Would you like them? Oh, wow. And these, yeah, and these records contain the warden report, the chaplain's report, the doctor's report, the inventory of what's in every room of every building, what happened in the buildings, the budget, all the prisoners, all their sentences. And I was like, that oh. is amazing. <laughs> I now have a place for it because I was literally writing part of that book going, I better figure out where she's at because she may be at one of the county jails. I didn't know mm -hmm. if she was at the state prison or not. So I just like made up a cell. And I'm like, this is really not my kind of idea of historical fiction where I just like make it up. Right. So uh, once I got hold of that, I could put her in the the right facility. And um, but But that's just an example of trying to find the details of the research. So I'm really big on uh, primary sources, and I love to look at diaries and um, really strange things like the, the accounting book for a mill to see all the mill girls and what they were paid and when. Um, so I did a ton, a ton of research. I had a assistant who helped me do research so I didn't end up you know, for three hours when I'm supposed to be writing a chapter, looking at different types of carriages, which I actually <laughs> did once. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was like, no, they're going in a carriage down the way. What sort of carriage would it be in 1855 that this family would own? I'm like, oh, that's such an interesting brougham. It's a brougham? Wow, what, where is it from? Let's go look. And then I like <laughs> call the guy who's... <laughs> who's like the preeminent coach dude in New Hampshire. <laughs> be like, would, 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 would this coach go down this street? Would this carriage be their kind? And he was awesome. He's like, you got to come to New Hampshire. We have the most coaches in the U.S. You, I will take you personally to all the places that they're kept. <laughs> <laughs> Full on like the nicest people in the world. The, so this one woman I had met, on Facebook, she goes, oh, my dad's a local historian in southwest New Hampshire where your book is set. Why don't you go see him? So I'm like, sure, why not? I go driving down this little road that's like in the middle. If you haven't been to New Hampshire, there are trees. There's like more trees than I've ever seen in my life in this state. So you're driving down this road with all these trees and they're like, go by the old peg shop. And I'm like, what is a peg shop? I don't even know what these things are. So just an aside, a peg shop is the tiny little pieces of wood that were put in shoe soles when the soles were okay. attached to the shoe. Yeah. Anyway, uh -huh. but his house was right there. I show up. He is amazing. So this this guy, Jay Shanks, he's about 82. He had all this material from family histories, not just his own, but other people within these counties laying on the kitchen table, big farm table, all these maps of what the area looked like way previous. And then we just took off in his truck and he showed me all these different places. We went way up in the woods and he's like, I want you to see what happens when a train doesn't go to a town because it was so important that the train came to your town. And we were literally in the middle of the woods with nothing. I'm like, why are we here? He said, this was a, the thriving town here, but the train went to Keene. So there's nothing left of it. So, I mean, oh, these wow. sorts of things are really interesting to me. And going to the basements of historical societies and seeing crazy things in them. I had one place where they're like, let me show you all the toys that were made in 1830 Keene. I'm like, okay, this is awesome. But I love all that. Yeah, you are and a nerd. And all of it I love lends it. itself. <laughs> See, it's a nerd. 
But I, I love how, <laughs> you know, I don't write about the big things. Like, my characters are never going to, like, see Lincoln talk at Gettysburg or see mm-hmm. the coronation of Napoleon as emperor or any of those things. It's it's all about people in day-to-day life. And most of us never saw any of those great things, the big things in history. So for me, it's to fill it in and make a reader feel like they're dropped in that time period. And that's tiny things to that do that with. The etui mm-hmm. for broider, embroidery, the type of thread, what's on the wall. You know, like the in the one scene there, the embroidered piece was the children who died. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So or be the, very um, nerdy. <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned toys and, you know, you describe some of the toys that are in the nursery. So, it you know, it mm-hmm. it comes into play. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, first of all, my dad is a retired librarian. So the fact that you use the phrase rock star librarian makes me happy. <laughs> and to everyone who thinks that libraries are really, there's no point to them anymore. There's so a point to libraries. Oh my God. Yes. Libraries are the most amazing places on earth. I, yes. I love them. And I love this librarian. Like I literally write her and I go, hey, this is the new book I'm doing. It's got these things in it. It's set in this period. She's like, I'm on it. (laughs) (laughs) Last month she wrote me because I wrote and I said, hey, this this third book I'm doing is going to have a seance that goes bad at a girl's school. She's like, really? We have all the spiritualist journals. I'm going to the basement. (laughs) Seriously. I love her. I will know, you know, it's like, I can't set a book in Oregon because I'd have to fly her here and give her a house. <laughs> and, and maybe a job at a, at a library. Exactly. So uh, I so, guess yeah, all of your stories will be on amazing. the East Coast. They are amazing. Uh, the next few are going to be <laughs> on the East Coast. They're all going to be set in the same uh, town. So in in Harborough which is set in 1855 for The Companion. The next book coming out is 1865. And then the next one is 1872. So all set in the same town. And in each one, one character shows up from the book before. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. So when does the next one come out? The next one comes out next January, 2021. That just sounds weird, 2021. And Doesn't that weird? Do you have a, a title for that? Yes, that's called After Alice Fell, and that's a historical thriller. And that's about a woman who was a Civil War nurse, and she comes home to find that her sister Alice has committed suicide at the asylum she had been sent to. And the lead, Marion, does not believe the story of the asylum, and she does not believe the story of why she was committed by her brother to begin with. So from that moment, it's her trek and struggle to figure out the truth. Mm-hmm. That sounds very so, You know, it's a high-caliber comedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like light reading. Yeah, something to just read. Yeah, really, really light good. reading. <laughs> it's a lot about... A lot about secrets and family secrets. That the, the little oh my gosh. edge. I'm I'm a little frightened to even know about the research that went into you know the finding out what happened in asylums at that point. That wow. <laughs> well, you know, my rock star librarian and I, we were trying to get into the asylum in New Hampshire. On that note, we're going to take a break because really, how often do you get to have that conversation of uh, my rock star librarian and I were trying to get into the asylum in New Hampshire? I have never said that sentence in my life until now. I've never had um, uh, the experience of trying to get a rock star librarian and myself into an asylum. Although my dad is a retired rock star librarian, maybe. Clearly, I am not having the appropriate experiences with my librarian father, and I should probably remedy that. But instead, we're going to go ahead and take that break. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, 
Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast, your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. You'll remember that right before the break, Kim had just said that uh, she and her rock star librarian friend were going to try and get into the asylum in New Hampshire. So we are going to jump really immediately right back into that conversation. We were going to go together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm like, if like I, can, I, so I called her. I'm like, Rebecca, if I can get into the asylum, will you go with me? She's but like, you make yes, it sound like I you're going to get like, to the admitted to the asylum. <laughs> <laughs> so the asylum is is um, in Concord, New Hampshire, and it's been most of the buildings in it are now reused and like for the Department of Education, which is hilarious. Um, that is weird. And <laughs> yeah, so I remember when I was going to the archives when I was doing research on the companion, I drove by this building. I'm like, oh my God, that's the asylum. Because I had already been thinking of after Alice fell and starting research on that. And that part of the building is closed. And we did try and get in, but the manager said that nobody can go in because it's unsafe. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, interesting, scary building. Yeah, I bet it's. I bet it's actually haunted. They they won't let you go in. Cause I it's ended haunted. up. You know what I ended <laughs> up doing was they were actually that asylum started with um, the Quakers, and the Quakers were really into having um, people in the asylum have open space and quiet, and also have industry. So it had its own working farm. And it basically uh, paid for itself. Oh, interesting. So that's where it started. And then you start running into the fact that more people are going there than should be in there, right? So it's overcrowded. And then all the crazy new, oh, how are we going to fix people? Then that started. Mm -hmm. So the Quaker thing very rapidly became (laughs) gotten, gotten away from. Right. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Which actually reminds me of one of the characters in the book, who is um, a phrenologist, and oh yes, Enoch Finch. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, I can't even come up with a good well, sentence. Phrenology. For him. He was. Yeah. He's. Um. It, it was a very big thing then, especially yeah. in the 1850s. By about the 1870s, it was sort of really out of fashion. But yeah. But, I can tell who you are by the bumps on your head. Right. And I, I'm going to be the uh, the medical expert at your trial. Mm, great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He's, um, a, he's a piece of work. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, when you are um, taking the time to read for yourself, what do you like to read? Um, I read... It depends on where I'm at in the process. Like right now I'm doing a lot of research, so I'm reading a lot of um, old books from the 1870s. Uh, but beyond that, for fun, I've been really into Laura Purcell. She writes Gothic. Um, she's a contemporary novelist. And Ruth Ware, she's awesome. Sort of like crime suspense novels. And uh, that's kind of Kind of what I'm reading right now is the two of them. And then I'm also, I'm going to a panel at Left Coast Crime. I'm on a panel at Left Coast Crime in a couple of weeks in San Diego on 19th century crime. And I'm reading all the other authors' books right now, and that's super, super fun. Oh, I bet. Yeah. And... um from your uh, when did you, when did you start writing? I, I didn't ask that. Did, is it something that you've always wanted to do, or how did you come about come to the process of writing for publication? Yeah, so I had always wanted to write, um, but I 
didn't do it as um, anything serious. First, I was in theater and doing all of that. And then I ended up writing two YA historicals, both of which were published. And this was a while ago. And really loved that. But I didn't really want to work in YA. So I was like, well, I'm going to learn how to write adult books. <laughs> so then I got more serious about it. And I was teaching writing. And I was also um, wrote a book that was a literary fiction that was completely boring but beautiful. So I tore it up, stole the characters, started writing another one. And then I got really serious when I got back to the companion. And I said, this is a commercial book. And this is a um, a genre that's good for me. It's a good, strong genre of, you know, because you can do so much in a historical mystery. Thank you. And out of your own uh, experience, do you have advice for uh, aspiring authors? Uh, finish your book. That would be my <laughs> advice for aspiring authors. Okay. <laughs> it's a, yeah, be really um, dedicated to yourself. When you promise yourself to finish a book, make a deadline and do it because you can't do anything without a finished product. And you can't learn anything and you can't grow without that. Well, well, Kim, if you're going to be all practical about having a finished book, fine. Uh. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm super practical about books. I mean, the last book after Alice Fell, I wrote it in nine months. Oh. So I had to have deadlines and discipline. And it's like the more you write, the more you end up writing in terms mm -hmm. of time. So, yeah, I'm, I'm super practical. <laughs> well, something has to be. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I have like, you know, everything's calendared out. I'm like, okay, this book comes out here. My developmental edits will come in this week. This week I'm going to do my pitch and proposal for the next book, you know, and it's like all color coded out for the next two years. Wow. I love it. So I, I guess you are not, <laughs> you are a plotter, not a pantser when it comes to writing. I'm actually right in the middle. Okay. I can't I can't do outlines because I don't know the characters and I don't know who's going to show up. So in the companion, Aurora and Enoch Finch completely showed up on their own. Oh. I would they were not in my my thing. So what I will tend to do is I'm really looking for voice first. So who's telling whatever story I had that initial image of and I'll play with that for a while. Then I will look for kind of who the other characters are, what I want to tell a little bit. And then after that, it's instead of an outline, I'll do um, the ending, what I think the ending might be, and then work backwards and just do a few big points. And, okay. and basically it's like, do they win, do they lose, or do they get away with it? <laughs> well, yeah, you need to <laughs> Because you need to I know like that. to find the characters. I, you know, they interest me. And, and if I make them up in my head, it's like all my author being my little brain making up the character. If I let them go on the page, they, they're they much more interesting. And they do things that are surprising and change the story in better ways. Mm -hmm. So see, right in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Plants. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's something with plants. Now I'm just picturing, I don't know, you've got, <laughs> I don't know what that looks like, but <laughs> um, I know you have a website, so tell people where they can find your website and if you have uh, any social media they can interact with you on. Absolutely. So my website is KimTaylorBlakemore.com. And um, you can go there and there's a link if you would like to join the newsletter. I do a monthly newsletter talking about some research and whatever I'm doing that month. Um, I'm on Instagram as Blakemore Kim Taylor and Facebook as Kim Taylor Blakemore. And um, I love talking to people. So please stop by. All right. And can they contact you on your website um, or just Absolutely. on social media? Okay. Wonderful. Oh, yeah, you can talk on my website. There's contact information. That's fine. Okay, cool. I had, um, I just literally last week had someone email me saying, I have to ask one question. I'm like, okay, <laughs> what's the question? Um, who killed Mary Dawson? 
<laughs> and did you answer her she or, said, or them? She said, this has been keeping me up, and my friend thinks it's one thing, and I think it's another. And then she went through all the reasons why she thought who ever killed Mary. And I wrote back and said, that is a really interesting theory. Thank you for sharing it. Because I can't answer. I'm, <laughs> I can't say. Do, do you know who killed Mary Dawson? I mean, of or, course or, I know or, who killed Mary <laughs> I'm just checking to make sure that it's not, you know, like you left it well, vague even for yourself. Yes, it depends on the day who I think killed her. I think that okay. there's you could there's two ways you can go with with that that young girl's death. Yes, and uh, but, for listeners, this no, is a and so nobody's and, really asked who killed Eugenie because I'm like I can't answer that. That is for you to answer. That's right. like asking Daphne Du Maurier. Did my cousin Rachel do it? <laughs> if she answers that, that ruins the book. <laughs> right. Which, yeah, by the you... way, is one of my favorite books. Um, and it still drives of... me batty because I don't know if she's guilty <laughs> or not. What I um I actually there's a lot of things that don't fully get answered in the book, which y- mm-hmm. you know, kind of uh, on the one hand, I appreciate because I'm thinking about the story for a long time after I finish it. On the other hand, I am the type of person who would be very happy with if every book came with a blog that outlined the next, like, I don't know, 150 years, so I knew exactly what had happened with everything. <laughs> um, you, uh, we do not get that with your book. <laughs> no, we don't. Um so, Kim, we've talked about a lot of different things today, and uh, is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to talk about in terms of writing or this book or any of your other books, anything we haven't covered? No, I think I think that this was great. I really, really appreciated it. Well, I, I appreciate super it. appreciate talking to you. Well, I, I had so much fun, even though my brain is nowhere near where it should be today. Um, oh. I'm going to blame my... I'm going to blame my husband for sharing his cold. Um, Oh, thank you. I'm sure he's happy about that. (laughs) Yes. So (laughs) thank you so much for joining me. Um, I had a a great time talking to you. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. (laughs) Thank you so much to Kim for taking the time to speak with me, for putting up with my loopiness. Um, I had a lot of fun. (laughs) I hope she had a lot of fun and wasn't... she was laughing with me and not just at me because I was losing my ever loving mind during the interview. Uh, yeah. Anyway, thank you to Kim for speaking with me about her novel, The Companion. Thank you, of course, as always to you, my listeners. I do have copies, as I said, of this book to give away. So in order to enter this giveaway, all you have to do is go to our social media GSMC Book Review, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Comment on this post. It's episode 217, Interview with Kim Taylor Blakemore. And tell me if you've ever had a rock star librarian in your life. Tell me about that experience. When you comment on this post, you will automatically be entered to win a copy of The Companion. Um, you, ha- you do have to comment to be entered into the giveaway. You can still, of course, like the post, share the post, all those wonderful things. And please do go to our social media and like, follow, share, retweet, do all of those wonderful things, as well as subscribing to the podcast if you are a fan, because if you're a fan, why wouldn't you subscribe to the podcast? If you're a fan and you are so inclined, I would love uh, a review and um, a five-star rating would be great. But do definitely enter the giveaway if you are interested in winning a copy of The Companion by Kim Taylor Blakemore. Thank you so much again for joining me. Join me again on Friday's episode when I will be speaking to um, Kevin D. Miller. I almost said Hart. Uh, Kevin D. Miller about the book Heart of Steel. That's where I got the mix up. And that is another historical fiction uh, this time set in the 1920s, but it is historical fiction based on the true story of his grandfather, and it is a really fascinating story. So join me on Friday for that. In the meantime, I hope you're having a wonderful week, and I hope that week involves plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. 
part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.